All right, well, good afternoon. My name is Bill Revere. I'm the State Safe Routes to School Coordinator from NJDOT's Bureau of Safety, Bicycle and Pedestrian Programs. As the SRTS Coordinator and Manager of our Local Planning Assistance Program, my work is all about improving safety and accessibility for people who walk and bike. I work with New Jersey municipalities on plans for improved bicycle and pedestrian circulation. I work with our TMA partners to educate children on how to walk and bike safely and have spoken at senior centers across the state, teaching about traveling safely as we get older. Worked in the bike ped world for over 20 years, and I'm amazed at how far we've come and all the improvements that we continue to make. Now, in this session, titled Safe Routes to High Schools, we'll focus on best practices for interacting with and involving high school students in Safe Routes to School programs. And we'll have some actual students as presenters, so that's exciting. Now, before we get started, please note that the session is being recorded, and after the Academy, the recordings of this and all the other sessions will be made available online. I hope you enjoy the session, which is our final session for the 2023 SRTS Academy. And uh, please visit the saferootsnj.org website, click on Safe Roots Academy, and you can view all the recordings if you missed anything. With that said, I'll now turn it over to our esteemed moderator, Sean Meehan. Thank you, Bill. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sean Meehan, and I'm the Research Project Manager of the New Jersey Safe Routes Resource Center, which assists public officials, transportation and health professionals, and the general public in creating a safer and more accessible walking and bicycling environment through primary research, education, and dissemination of information about best practices in policy and design. While I've enjoyed all of this year's New Jersey Safe Fruits Academy sessions, I have to admit this is the one I'm most excited for. With the passing of the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA, for the first time, the needs of high schools and high school students are being explicitly considered in Safe Fruits to School projects and programs and infrastructure funding. With this broadened mission in mind, today our panel will discuss how we can best um, meaningfully involve high school students in Safe Routes to School programs and projects. Our panel will kick off with a short presentation from me about the New Jersey Safe Routes to School program and its expansion of high schools. Next, we will hear from Sharnell Hicks, principal of CH Planning, who will provide an overview of national resources and the issues, needs, and concerns related to involving high school students in Safe Routes to School. Following Charnel, we will hear from Deborah Schultz of the Center for Community Planning, who will tell us about the City Planning Institute, a curriculum-based program that trains students in the city planning and the community development process. We're also fortunate today, as Bill mentioned, to be joined by some students from the City Planning Institute, who will tell us about their experiences and give us some great insights into effectively engaging high school students. Now I'll get session started um, and kick things off here. So just a little information about Safe Routes to School. Of course, we have to start. The Safe Routes to School program is a federal, state, and local effort that creates safer and more appealing conditions for walking, bicycling, and using other wheeled active transportation devices as a healthy part of everyday life. The overarching goal of the program is where it's safe to get youth, uh, including those with disabilities, walking, bicycling, and rolling to school, and where it's not safe to make it safe. The New Jersey Safe Routes to School program vision is Safe Routes for All. Safe Routes for All provides safe and equitable access to active transportation for people of all ages and abilities from all backgrounds and neighborhoods in New Jersey. The New Jersey Safe Routes to School program mission is to partner with schools and communities to prioritize and implement opportunities for people to walk, bike, or travel by other wheel devices. By focusing on improvements to support active travel, we believe we can create conditions that are safe healthy, equitable, and appealing for all. So since the inception of the program, the statewide safe school program in 2000, and the addition of federal funding in 2005, there has been a phenomenal array of accomplishments that have positioned the New Jersey program among the most successful in the nation. For example, the establishment of the New Jersey Safe Routes Resource Center in 2006, and the adoption of the Complete Streets Policy at NJDOT in 2009. Also the establishment of regional Safe Routes to School coordinator at all eight of New Jersey's TMAs in 2011. 
In addition, the establishment of the statewide crossing guard training and resources program in 2013 and the creation of the complete and green streets model policy in 2019. These are just some of the many ways the statewide program has um, grown and changed over the years and helped to create safer conditions for children walking and bicycling and strengthened its reach and outcomes. With new federal funding, the statewide Safer School Program continues to grow and change. In November 2021, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, IIJA, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, um, was signed into law. IIJA authorizes, reauthorizes the nation's surface transportation, drinking water, and wastewater legislation. It includes $550 billion in funding for new programs, approximately half of which goes to the U.S. Department of Transportation over the next five years. Many aspects of IIJA relate directly to Safe Routes to School and the work um, accomplished through Safe Routes to School programs. So the new law is focused on prioritizing communities where there has been chronic underinvestment and a lack of participation in transportation decision. The new law has provided increased funding in transportation equity, sustainability, resilience, climate change, safety, and asset condition. The new law is also focused on improving safety and accessibility for people walking, bicycling, and using other micromobility modes, such as uh, scooters, e-scooters, and e-bikes. So all things very much related to safe routes to school. One of the biggest changes directly related to Safe Routes to School, the IIJA recodified the program um, and amended it to extend the program through 12th grade, directly allowing projects that enable and encourage high school students to walk and bike to school safely for the first time, instead of limiting the program to students in grades K through eight. So one of the first changes to the longstanding New Jersey statewide program uh, that we've seen already is inclusion of projects that benefit students in grades K through 12 as eligible projects under the Safe Routes to School Infrastructure Grant Solicitation. So applications are now being accepted through November 17th for federal Safe Routes to School uh, funding. So what projects are eligible? So projects must encourage and enable children in grades K through 12 to walk and or bicycle to school. They must be within two miles of a K through 12 school. They must also be infrastructure projects only. So, um, you know, direct construction projects, fixing intersections, adding sidewalks, things like that. For infrastructure projects, public funds must be spent on projects within the public right of way. This may include projects on private land that have public access easements. Public property includes lands that are owned by a public entity, including those lands owned by public school districts. For projects on private land, there has to be a written legal easement or other written legally binding agreement that ensures public access to the project. So here are some key dates to keep in mind. Um, potential applicants need to remember that one-on-one -on -one meetings with NJDOT local aid are mandatory for these applications. So appointments should be scheduled at njdotlocalaidrc.com. Be sure to schedule your appointment and to get started on applications so that you can meet the um, November 17th deadline. To learn more about the grants and the application process, uh, join us for our last webinar on October 4th, 2023, which is scheduled from 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. You can register at, at the Safe Fruits uh, Resource Center website. Recordings from previous grant webinars can also be viewed at the Resource Center website. So the infrastructure side of the Safe Routes School program has been updated to include high schools, but what about the rest of it? There's a lot more to Safe Routes to School than just infrastructure grants. While there are many opportunities that exist for expanding programming to high schools within the current program structure, we also need to explore new avenues and new partnerships to ensure continued program excellence. To be truly inclusive of high school students, we must strive for their meaningful participation in Safe Routes to School projects and programs. Roger Hart's Ladder of Children's Participation is an excellent framework to keep in mind as we pursue expansion to high schools. Each ascending rung of the ladder represents increasing levels of agency, control, or power for students. The first three rungs are not considered participation and include activities or programs planned for youth by adults in which they have no input, 
little understanding of the project purpose and um, lack opportunities to provide real feedback. To effectively include and engage high school students, we need to focus on higher rung projects and programs that allow shared decisions and shared benefits. The Expanding the New Jersey Safe Routes to School Program to High Schools report is a first effort in this process. The document is a compilation of considerations related to expanding Safe Routes to School programming to high schools that was informed by discussions with New Jersey's TMA Safe Routes to School coordinators. The document explores options within the current program structure, potential new avenues for exploration, and potential new partners. This work is being continued by the New Jersey Safe Routes Resource Center in coordination with our partners at CH Planning. Before I turn the presentation over, I wanna encourage you to take a look at this document, which is available on the New Jersey Safe Routes Resource Center website. Now I will turn the presentation over to Sharnell Hicks from CH Planning to tell us more about some of the national best practices for high school inclusion and Safe Routes to School expansion that they have identified so far. So Sharnell, if you're ready, take it away. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's been a, a great um, pleasure uh, to work with Rutgers and to really have an opportunity to, to see how we might best engage high school students. CH Planning is one of the partners who worked with the National Safe, Safe Routes to School Engineering Guide that was um, prepared for younger students. And it's exciting to, um, to share with you what we've learned um, I'm the president of CH Planning. I worked with colleagues Olivia Foster, Karen Armanderas, and Rhoda Spilicelli, excuse me, in um, preparing this research. Can we start? Wonderful. So some of the challenges we um, identified, this is a new opportunity. Working with high school students is is different than working with um, younger children. That um, engagement ladder that that uh, Sean shared with us kind of demonstrates where we've been and, and where we can really go. Um, sustained engagement, our high school students have a lot on their plates and a lot more control over how they'll engage and what they'll do um, and how they'll spend their time, what their interests are. Um, and so being able to keep their attention and, and really allow opportunities for them to stay engaged in these programs is, is a real challenge, um, also an opportunity. In addition to working with um, specific high school students and high school groups, it's important to engage organizations. So one of the beautiful things about our children and our, our high school students and our high school children as well, is they grow up and they move on. So um, having organizational engagement allows continuity from year to year, from high school class to high school class as our um, students age out. Some of the opportunities that we see and, and that we found in our research is using new um, engagement techniques that specifically speak to the interest of um, our young adults. Empowering through participation is important and also leveraging wider networks beyond the, the specific um, high school institution. Next. So in um, Marin County, um, one of the techniques that was used there was engaging a toolkit or developing a toolkit that could be used from one year to the next and to provide high school students with ready tools that they could that they could use and engage. So um, including um, things like banners, things like um, kind of how-to guides. Um, another another technique that was used was having regular, regularly planned um, bike ride events, things that students could look forward to that could engage the broader community. Um, a practical uh, technique that was used here was having opportunities for kids to help others with bicycle maintenance. It's one thing to have a bike and to, to ride it to school, um, learning how to keep your bike up, learning um, how to use the tools to be able to use, to rely on your bicycle as a reliable mode of transportation. Those are skills, those are tools. Um, 
that are important. And it was really great to empower these young people to be able to help their peers um, do this work. And then there are these fun events. In this case, we're talking about a, a transit race where students had an opportunity to challenge each other and challenge themselves to get from one, from point A to point B using transit, allowing them to learn the transit system um, and to be able to be more comfortable using, um, using transit, uh, finding the connections that they need. And, and sometimes in some cases asking for the help they needed to get from point A to point B when, when you might not be quite sure how to read that map on your own. Next. In Cupertino, um, there was a working group that was formed that, um, a, that really uh, throughout the school year, like a club was able to to work with work on the program to develop the program to get the word out and to um, engage uh, student peers in um, in using bicycles and transit to get to school. There was a grant program that allowed um, students to get funding for special programs and projects uh, that supported the the Safe Routes to School program. And there were fun contests and prizes for um, participation and engagement. Next. So at Guardy High School, there was a club that was established um, after a, a fatality. And, and it's, it's something that happens and it's something that can really allow um, allow for students to, in this case, to grieve and, and to really take action in a meaningful way. Um, our program, uh, we're hoping that that we'll be able to to take proactive action. But if we, one of the things that we've learned is that these high school students. Um, can connect to stories and real events. And so um, even as we talk about um, allowing opportunities for children, for older children to participate in these programs, there's always, we, we have to be sure that there's always a why. Uh, we've found in our research that extending that why to include not only transportation, but also environment and equity allows for more meaningful participation, um, a deeper degree of engagement and more success in the overall um, program. Uh, the ASAP program, they included um, uh, tactical urbanism, which is, is a fun way of getting the community out in the street to draw what um, what a, a better improved co crosswalk might be to um, express um, kind of an urban design vision and to to really um, have a hands on particip participatory experience on what safer bicycle, pedestrian, and transit. Um, can look like. We'll go to the next slide. At the uh, California Fields uh, School, there were bike packing tours, um, a lot of really fun um, outdoorsy um, uh, experiences. And it's important to say with participation, having a group of of folks or a club that um, meet regularly, who can rely on each other, who have shared interests really makes a, a big difference. But um, in these bike tours, the, the group provided outfitting. We talked earlier about an earlier case where there were um, workshops on maintenance. In this case, uh, the tours provided bikes, clothing, equipment, training, and, and snacks so that there could be a really fun um, outing to get the community 
um, the high school community comfortable with using their bicycles. Academic cre credits were granted for participation. And the, um, the group really, uh, again, in, in, as we talk about making connections with things beyond transportation, the group used historical and cultural destinations to, um, to motivate folks to be more engaged and connected. Um, the California Field School really built on social and environmental justice goals, again, in addition to, um, to just transportation. And um, in this particular case, there were special um, three-wheel club activities that were linked, that were specific to, um, to women and girls, um, and uh, folks with all sorts of diverse differences. So uh, again, getting from home to school is interesting and engaging. But when we when we think about high school students who are who are on the verge of being adults, right? Children know more. They they start to think more about what kind of impact they will have in the world and um, connecting these these programs connecting to bigger um, social economic um, issues really made a dis difference in encouraging participation and the level of deep engagement next So in Montgomery County, the um, Youth Vision Zero Ambassador Program, for those of you who aren't um, familiar with what Vision Zero is, it's a goal of having zero um, deaths or fatalities uh, related to um, traffic and transportation. Um, so this ambassador program was an annual program, happened every year, and our research did find that programs that um, had recurring themes were more sustainable because each each successive class or each successive year could build and improve on what was done before. Um, again, this program uh, was multifaceted, engaging on around traffic, safety, leadership, and all of these all of these programs have really built, a leadership cohort um, and skills that go beyond transportation and, and beyond high school life. Um, and also this, the program had a lot of different engagement techniques similar to some of the ones that we talked before. In, um, in this particular program, um, student service was a state requirement. Uh, and you'll find that in places and schools uh, whether they're public or public, private, or parochial, that um, many of our high schools have um, student service requirements. And this is a, you know, these programs are a really great way to, um, to help our student peers um, and to help our communities. Um, safety and health and safety are important issues for everyone, and it, it's something that everyone can relate to. Next. So now we're going to talk a little bit about networks beyond the schools. And some of these are um, national um, national programs, and um, one of the things that we found by connecting high school um, safe routes to, to school programs with broader networks is it it brings um, can bring more uh, more resources. Um, more opportunities for for learning and improvement, more um, more synergies um, around tools and techniques, but there are also opportunities to to build um, networks around specific groups. So perhaps folks who share disability in common or um, other other identity. Uh, issues. When you have a national organization, you can have a smaller 
group participating at a specific school that connects with um, with a, a larger kind of common common thread um, with folks in other areas. So in this particular group, um, there was a safety and, and health focus. Um, there was a, a fellowship that helped to fund the program. Mentoring was an important part. So the larger in organization mentored the group at the specific school. And the, the group provides seed money for these types of programs. So by um, working with a, a network such as this one, it's possible to, um, to really build on uh, build on the experience of a group that's been in this area for a long time. And it takes some of the onus off of the, the local, the teachers um, and the local professionals um, to, to provide that support to students. Next slide, please. So this one, this organization is a youth-led nonprofit. Uh, and again, especially with um, an organization like this that's actually led by youth, folks in different um, high school groups are able to connect with peers who, um, who have maybe more bandwidth or more resources to provide support. Um, so this this organization sponsors one of the big things this organization does is sponsor a, a youth bike summit bringing people from different schools different communities together to talk about these um to talk about these issues next so the youth cycling coalition is a coalition of Ten organizations, um, and they they really work on infrastructure issues. So um, you know more the physical than the the programmatic. Um, and one of the things that we'll have to to work on um, as we as we build out our programs is to um, to work on the programmatic, right? Getting folks in the habit of of taking their bike making people feel comfortable, making students feel comfortable walking to school, um, finding those best routes, um, having folks collaborate around these issues. But um, we'll also need to, to work on making sure that the, the routes are actually safe, that the sidewalk conditions are good, um, and that uh, novice cyclers can have an opportunity to feel more comfortable. And that's what this coalition really focuses on. Next. So the overall big picture lessons that we learned, multiple engagement channels work best. It, not everyone receives messages the same. Empowering youth, giving youth agency is important. Offering incentives. Um, it, these students have heavy course loads, lots of activities these days. So being able to un incentivize students to participate Especially, especially folks who are heavily um, programmed, and also folks who maybe, you know, aren't sure about um, about trying a new mode to school. Leveraging organizations, we talked about that. Building on work that's already been done is important, and then connecting to meanings to meaning um, beyond just transportation. So with that. All right, great. Thank you, Charnel. So Thank we are you. going to move on now and we're gonna hear from Deborah Schultz from the City Planning Institute. So Deborah, if you're ready, take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us here today. We're so excited and grateful. We're having a ton of fun over here. If you can't see us on screen, there's a lot of giggling and laughter. Um, so today's a good day. I'm Deb Schultz. I am uh, the co-founder and program manager of the Center for Community Planning. We run and host the City Planning Institute. Uh, Sean, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, please. If you can, there we go. 
Um, so we, uh, again, Center for Community Planning, we run the City Planning Institute. This is a program for teenagers. Um, this started out as a very, very small after school program uh, led by volunteers, teachers, and volunteers from the community about 10 years ago. Um, and it has grown uh, pretty significantly. Now we are running the City Planning Institute in um, at least five cities, at least five different programs um, every summer. And our goal is to increase uh, youth engagement in the city planning process. So we work to connect young people with city planning projects, uh, redevelopment projects um, that are happening in their towns. And we sort of um, create like a triangular partnership now. So we have typically we partner with a community based organization as well as a uh, municipal entity, whether it's a town council or a city planning department or the mayor's office, um, to give the students real planning projects. Um, we believe you know, wholeheartedly that young people should absolutely have a voice in the projects that are shaping the future of their neighborhoods. Um, the more we, we engage youth in these planning efforts, the more we learn uh, how much they actually have to say about what should be happening in their town. Uh, very strong, opinionated young people. Um, so I'm not gonna take too much of their time, but I do wanna highlight just a few projects that we've done in the past. Uh, Sean, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Um, again, with this primary goal of really, really connecting young people with actual planning projects that are happening in their neighborhoods so that they can um, give real live contributions. Uh, in 2021, we were in Newark. Um, our Newark students were tasked with creating a cultural asset inventory, um, one of the big cultural assets that the students felt was worthy of protecting, which is, again, a very interesting perspective, something that um, adults may not find as a priority. They, they thought it was really worthwhile to protect um, the graffiti art throughout the city of Newark. They felt that there were really, really great murals all over the city um, and they wanted to identify where those were and protect them. This was in an effort to um, add this component to um, the master plan that was being developed in 2021 in Newark. And so they did. They went out in um, city vans and we rode around the city for weeks um, taking pictures of every piece of graffiti art that we could find. Um, they documented it. They uh, were able to identify over 1,500 unique public art displays and create an interactive map for the city. Um, so the city now has this interactive map where you can kind of click on a point and pull up any piece of graffiti art throughout the city. Um, they now have this as an interactive piece to their Newark 360 master plan um, in an effort to protect some of these pieces. So shout out to those students. Um, Sean, if you don't mind going to the next slide. This is another uh, project that we did in 2022. This was in Patterson. Um, there was a very um, underutilized uh, you know, section of a street in Patterson that the students found was worthy of redevelopment. It was very close to the Passaic County Community College. Um, there's a famous old theater that sat on the corner of that um, you know, Main Avenue there, and um, that was completely dilapidated and uh, not being used. So they chose this uh, area to create sort of a, a plaza, a pedestrian plaza where young people can come and hang out and uh, read books and, you know, just enjoy the weather. Um, and they did a really, really great job of designing really innovative kind of styles for this pedestrian plaza. And they also had the idea to create a, an app um, which is being currently revisited uh, for development, but an app where people can sort of self-guide themselves throughout the city um, and find these little pockets of, of great areas and great places that people should be visiting throughout the city. Um, and again, that app is, um, again, being revisited to be redeveloped now. So next slide, please, Sean. You're doing all right on time. Um, in the theme of safe routes to schools uh, in Trenton, this was actually a, a project that kind of spanned over the course of two summers. Um, students in Trenton wanted to create a park. They live in this uh, section of town. It's, it's a Donnelly housing project. Um, and they were you know, saying that they didn't really have access to playgrounds in their neighborhood. So they wanted to create 
a playground. They wanted to incorporate really cool things into that playground, very innovative, you know, zip lines and fountains. Um, and so they, they did, they created this uh, development plan for a park, presented it to the mayor's office, and then the following summer, we went back, worked with um, another group of students who said, yes, this park was really great, but we can't get there safely. Um, it's four blocks away from us, but the walk is really unsafe. There's a lot of prop, you know, it's very problematic along the way. Um, and so they decided to create a safe route to the park. Um, and again, came up with really innovative ideas, 3D art on the pathways there so that people in the neighborhood knew that this was a children's walkway. Um, innovative streetscapes, putting uh, really nice paintings. As you can see on the slide, they, they uh, propose that they should paint off the boards on a lot of the abandoned buildings that they were passing by on their walk there. Um, and so again, just really, really creative ideas that us as adults may not typically think of. Um, and again, they went back to the mayor's office, presented this to um, their elected officials and community stakeholders um, and I'm pretty sure that that bottom part right there where they're painting the abandoned buildings has begun and they're actually doing it on the streets too um, to show specific crosswalks and specific pathways to the parks. So very cool, very you know, young people driven ideas um, coming to fruition in some of these cities. Next slide, Sean, please. Um, and so there's another project that we really wanted to highlight today, um, and that's the one that we just did this past summer in Bloomfield, New Jersey. Um, students were tasked with a very, very large project to possibly create the very first youth voice component in a master plan. Uh, Bloomfield is in the process of revamping their master plan. So we wanted to add a youth voice actual section into that master plan. I am not going to speak through this one. I'm going to turn this one over to my colleagues if they're ready to go. Yes. And so um, I'm going to introduce this is. Hi, I'm Isabella. Um, I'm the class of 2025. Uh, Hi, I'm Marie Tolusma, and I'm the class of 2024. Hi, I'm Ara. I'm class of 2024 as well. I'm Ula, I'm class of 2024. Next slide, please, Sean. Thank you. Uh, so we did something called the Municipal uh, Internship Planning Youth for our city. And these are just pictures of all of what we had did. We had met with students, even though we're sitting inside school, but we met with younger students and in our community to figure out what needed to be fixed and what didn't need to be fixed. And one of the things was we had to learn what city planning was to begin with, because like I said, we're all kids ourselves. So we took a day to really understand and try to figure out a way for us to understand and guide other kids our age to understand what we needed to do or what was needed in our community. And then next, we brainstormed so we wrote down ideas and thoughts of what we had. We made charts and pictures of what we felt like needed to be fixed or changed in our community, of what we observed as kids walking around. Uh, number two, we did something called a SWAT, SWAT analyst. And basically, that was a strength, weakness, and opportunity and threat. So we went around. We, each, we divided up our town by uh, these numbers. And each of us lived in a specific town part. So we each went in that specific town and we were like, okay, this is what our weaknesses, our strengths, our opportunities and our threats. So things we need to fix, things that were not safe for us, or not, not just us, but everybody in the community as well was not going to work or things that just needed to be maybe a little fixed, not too much in it. Uh, next, we did something called a developed visionary lesson. So what we did was we went to younger kids, so like elementary and middle schoolers. We went to their camps during the summer, and we asked them to draw and write down ideas that they felt like needed to be changed in their school because they will continue on to still be in school. So some of the kids drew pictures of like them wanting movie theaters and bowling alleys and just stuff that they felt like would entertain them and keep them around in their community because we'll be the next generation to stay in our community. So what would keep us here longer and would just keep us, keep the town to keep on growing as it is. So we had them draw pictures. We had them, if you see at the picture at the top, we had them write um, 
ideas that they felt like needed to be fixed in their school when we had it put up on sticky notes and that was something we also did. Uh, something else we also did was um, we interviewed people. So we went around our community, us ourselves, went around our community and we decided to, uh, what's the word? We just decided to ask people what they felt like. So it wasn't just kids, it was just everybody who lived there. We decided to figure out what needed to be done or what they felt like they wanted or felt like to keep or change. So we made a, a Google form for them to fill out. So we weren't just reaching just specific people, we were reaching everybody we could reach. And we reached over 200 people in, in just general, so 300 plus actually. And uh, we're continuing to hope to do this again next year. And I would love to be a part of that next year as well. Uh, Oh, yes. Um, <coughs> survey social media. Um, <clears throat> the next thing we did was after we did all this, we create a form, a Google form online, where we post each one of us post it on our social media, and we send it out to our friends and our our classmate, our team, sport teams, if we're in sport teams, and send it around to everyone in the town. Question about the town. This one, what we heard from those young kids that we went to camp with, we we questioned them, and we used their ID. We asked questions, and then we send it out for everyone around our high school, including elementary school, um, younger kids, even our adult, everyone was respond to the form. Um, this is what they think of, of it. And afterwards, we all come together. We look at the Google form, see what everyone says. And we, 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 talk, without, we talk it out with everyone. And we figure out what's best. And then we go out there and present it to the mayor, and everyone else. Um, yeah, so adding on to that, like making all the data. So we had like the we had like the the Google form and we went to the camps and that was a lot of information. Like I don't know if you can see the picture where it's well. There's a lot all that information is from the kids and like from the parks. We had all these interviews, so also easy way to like put it together and so the mayor could see it and like everyone else. So we made a Google slide and like we put all the things we want, not only what we want, but what the town wants. So that's obviously really important because we were only like 25 students, which is a lot, but there's a lot more youth in our town at least. And like we're going to be living here. So we need to be the ones, we don't need to, but it'd be better if we were able to decide the things. So we compiled that and then we said what everyone else wanted and what we found places that could be in use. So like, for example, if we have a couple things that maybe don't look great with our town and things that could go there instead. So we put that on the thing and on the slideshow and then like ideas that can go there. So that was really good. Um, and then so after we presented, like we presented to the mayor and all the council people and that was really fun. But, and they were able to get our suggestion because most of the council people are older than us, and it, but it was really nice because we were able to present to them and they were able to like understand our ideas because a lot of them didn't really understand what the youth wanted, and we have a lot of towns near us that might the youth might want to go to instead, and obviously we want the youth to stay in our town in Greenfield, so it was really important for our youth boys to help them stay here. So doing that, we also need to commute that because the internship is only. <laughs> The internship is only two weeks, which is great, but two weeks isn't really going to do much. We need to get to do that. So we went to the, we the internship, and then one of the rec officers, I think, he suggested that we make another town council to continue. So I'm actually coach, I'm actually co-chairing with Ms. Schultz, a committee that's going to work with the town council, find what students want throughout the year. So like recreation and just programs in general, like, and we can change it because two weeks isn't really going to do much if we can continue that into the school year where kids, their kids actually go to school and we can find out what they want. That's amazing. So it's called the Municipal Youth Guidance Council and we're going to have all these students and be able to talk to the councilwoman and the internship was great, but we were, we were able to only talk to them a couple of times, but we're going to be meeting with the council people and the mayor multiple times a year so we can give them updates and see what we want. So hopefully that goes well. Uh, next slide, Sean, please. Yeah. <laughs> next slide. Did, it, did we miss one? 
Can you go back, Sean? Did that happen? Are we missing one? Did I? Uh... Okay. Can we speak through it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you remember it? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. This happens in high school all the time. So <laughs> responsiveness is key. Perfect. So uh, as I was saying, one thing that we found that was a big um, problem is the lack of jobs for the youth in our town. Um, a big thing that we got from a lot of the kids our age or kids um, about to graduate middle school is that they're looking for job opportunities and they're not finding many. And the few jobs they are finding aren't good enough for them to want to stay with. Um, another thing we found was that people our age and younger really um, care about how the town looks. So a big thing we got was we need more decorations, more plants. Um, some of the empty storefronts and such need to be filled. Um, and um, transportation safety is a big issue for us. One thing we found was on Broad Street, I think there is a big lack of bike lanes. And one thing that happens that I've <laughs> one thing that happens that even I've heard from my own friends is that when they are riding their bikes on like the sidewalk, they're getting yelled at by older people who are trying to walk on the sidewalk with them. So a big issue is that we don't have anywhere to ride our bikes or get to school safely. And cars are turning on red. There's big traffic problems. Just transportation, transportation safety in general has been a big issue for you. Yeah. Um, Young people have a lot of ideas that they're having a hard time sharing because they're either not feeling heard or they have no where to share their ideas to. So a big thing for us is just social media, making sure we're putting it out there that youth voices are wanting to be heard. And then also, I think that like it's, we have to find problems, but we also have to find solutions. So like for jobs, we suggested that there would be incentives for companies to hire the youth. Because not many companies are going to want to hire these anyway, so like incentives are really important. And for making more bike lanes or making them safer, because we have them in the parks, but we can't get to the park if there's no safe bike lane. So like making, like we suggested making a turn lane, like an extra turn lane, so we can have like separate ones, or making it, because there's a lot of designated new bike lanes in the parks, but when you get onto the main roads, there's none. And so we suggest to make those or make them more so people could see so people aren't like, why are these people just spiking on the road? So maybe making them more designated and we found solutions to like other problems. Like we have a abandoned middle school, which is really dangerous. We found like turning that into something else, like one of these ideas, like and decorations. So we found stuff like that to be really helpful. So not only do we find problems, we find solutions that could go there. So I feel like it was a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of quality work going yes. on here. Um, next slide. And so I know that um, we have some questions for the students. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you all so much for being a part of this. This is great. You guys made some excellent points. And one of the things you said that first off that struck me immediately is, uh, I forget which one of you said it, but one of you said, you know, we want youth to stay in our communities. I can't tell you how many planning meetings I've been at with older people. And they're like, how do we get youth to stay in this area? Well, you know what, ask them, you know, that you guys really brought up an important point. I mean, you know, we can't have people who really aren't part of that generation making the decisions, trying to figure out why people would want to stay. So that's one of the things you said immediately that struck with me. Um, so I had some questions I wanted to ask, and, and this is uh, related to some of the stuff you, you've you hit on already. First of all, and this is something you were just talking about social media. Um, what do you feel is the best way uh, to communicate with younger people? And where do you get information that you trust and rely on about what's happening in your own town or community? Um, yeah, so kids and students are on their phones a lot, and it's often complained about by people older than us, but um, it's actually a really big help in the sense that we're always on our phones, because the biggest way you can reach us is through social media. So um, even like sending out emails through school emails, most people check those, but social media is really the biggest way to reach 
the youth effectively and quickly. Um, in Bloomfield, we were able to reach way more students using social media than we would have been able to without it. Like we mentioned, we reached almost 300 people using social media, but it, it's just, social media is a big part of the way we live our lives, so using that would definitely help us connect to what you guys are trying to do. Yeah. yeah. And social media specifically, I'm just curious what you guys use the most. Um, yeah, continuing on yeah. with what she said, I would say that right now it's TikTok, but Instagram is also part of it. So TikTok and Instagram is one of, I would say, the biggest social media used by the younger generation. I wouldn't say Instagram fully just yet because, you know, some kids are still in middle school, so some parents might not be okay with that. So TikTok is really one of the biggest platforms to use when trying to get a message through to kids. And sometimes not even just kids, there's adults on there now as well. It's just every generation you can think of on there, things are getting, some people are getting famous using TikTok. So I would say TikTok is like a really good way to really communicate or get things through past and just, yeah. And also I kind of think that like, like besides social media, I think a lot of times you can look at stuff because I have a terrible memory. And I look at stuff and I completely forget. But I feel like we have morning announcements, and even in our school, things are completely disconnected. So I think if like people are able to announce things, like or like if you're able to get it to the schools, like say this announcement, like this is really important. Like I, I don't know, I'm a little splitting better, but I don't know, just me. But I think it's a lot of people that I they can get and be easier to people to remember and to understand about it. Um, yeah. Also, like I was saying right now. Um, like when we were doing the whole city planning, half of the stuff we were kind of doing was social media, especially when we were doing the Google form. Um, we have to send it, all of them out there and then in like in our story, like posting it online so like kids could respond to it. Cause that's how a lot of us here communicate to others. There was even talk during the, the sessions that they should make TikToks encouraging young kids to get involved with planning, like, you know, make it a trend. You know, our, our internet is unstable. Um, making it a trend, you know, you want to be the man, come and contribute to the plan or something like that, but making it fun and exciting for kids and, and pushing it out on TikTok. See, you like that. Great. <laughs> that actually leads yeah. perfectly into one of the other questions. So what do you think is the best way to encourage young people to be more involved in their community? Um, yeah, again, really social media. Um, on Instagram, there's a thing where you can make a clickable little caption kind of on stories and other people can post what you're trying to say. So I think Instagram for me is the biggest one where I'm on a lot and I get a lot of my news about the town. So Instagram and really like starting trends that kids want to be involved in, like helping them have fun with what you're trying to do is really a big thing, I think. And also, if I understand like with y'all being older, social media isn't something, <laughs> I'm not going to nobody else, <laughs> isn't something that it's harder for y'all to really like try to use, obviously you need younger people when trying to do it. So if social media isn't like, isn't the only option, but actually like, allowing us to have a say in certain things especially in our community like allowing us to put our input and actually taking our in input and putting it out there would actually encourage people to be like for well, us younger to encourage us to be like oh they use my idea i want to do this again like yeah yeah i also think social media is great but like for this year we were paid um <laughs> say that and that drove me um, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and i think honestly I don't think a lot of people that did the internship would have done it if it was unpaid. So I think money is a great, great <laughs> right. way. Yeah. Um, right. Also, like food, like I'm, <laughs> I'm also like doing a club, and we we're like you can get candy if you sign up, and we had so many sign ups, and I think that's like really important. Yeah. So yeah. Like, I think I think if you um like internships, especially like. I mean, obviously it was paid, but also like internships where we're actually doing stuff. Like we were actually talking to the council women yeah, because yeah. we have like student governments, but um, it takes a lot of work to get stuff done. But if we're actually talking to the council people and we're actually talking to the mayor and our ideas are actually being used, I feel like when you see success in what you're like saying, I feel like that definitely makes motivation for other students. Yeah. Um, to be honest, um, a lot of teenage, a uh, teenage teenagers and kids we love like fun activities like sports all those kinds of stuff 
like for you like when you like getting involved in the community like if anything that's fun like fun activities sports i know a lot of kids love sports they love fun activities they love hanging out they love having fun so like anything that's fun like enjoyable like they will want to join it be a part of the community they will want to do it if it's part of the community yes so if anyone, uh, there were some other questions we had too, but people can feel free to go back to the ones we've already touched on as well. But I guess, um, what it, what would you all suggest to an adult who wants to include students in planning or other decision-making? So what do you think the best, uh, I know we've talked about social media, but what do you think the best way is to get started? So what type of programs, you know, help us craft our approach, I guess is my question. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I definitely think a big part of it is starting young and getting kids involved at a young age so that when they get older, they already know my voice is going to be heard. I know what I'm, I'm going to be able to accomplish. So they're going to be more encouraged to do that because they're going to be able to see the success from a young age as they get older. Mm -hmm. And again, with the internships and all that stuff, I think that's also really important. Yeah. But again, starting young because lead by example, right? If you see someone older than you has success, you're probably going to want to do that too. Yeah. Like, thanks on you, I'm going for it. Yeah. yeah. Right, great. Um, what decisions do you think young people should be involved in? What do you feel you're kind of currently being left out of that you want to be a part of? Um, honestly, I feel like most of the decisions regarding the town were kind of being left out of. Yeah. Before this internship I did over the summer, I wasn't seeing really any student or youth involvement in big decisions. So I think definitely just making sure we are involved in most, if not all, of the decisions that are going to affect our town that we're going to be inheriting soon is definitely important. Because I think eventually it's going to affect us, right? And if it is going to affect us, why shouldn't we have a say in it? So I think specifically, like, like if an art infrastructure and like stuff like that, like anything that's gonna affect us, I think we should have some sort of a say in. Can you give examples of like committees that you would sit on or you think a child should be sitting on I mean, in a town? Definitely this is definitely reaching, but I mean safe safe rooms for kids. I mean like kids you should be a part of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is about kids. Kids. And I feel yeah. like uh, it's been talked about a lot, but I think definitely testimonies from kids would be really important because then they can explain what they want or what's beneficial for them. Or like the school board. It's about yeah. schools. Schools weren't going to, or we're attending. I feel like we should be having a say or giving a part. Yeah. Because we're going to be the ones in school. We're the ones learning. So I would say those are the main for kids. Yeah. Definitely. Great points. <laughs> um, so. How well do you think um, the transportation issues and concerns of youth are currently addressed? Um, I don't think they're actually handled very, very well. In my town, I don't think they're held very well because, like, there's a lot of students who walk or ride the bus or just drive their um, bikes, ride their bikes. And like we were saying in the beginning, there's no bike lanes and kids are getting yelled at for being riding on the road the sidewalks even though this is their way of getting home so i feel like those right there with transportation situations those are like the biggest ones or with the buses the bus don't have enough space for everybody to be riding on and stuff like that and walking home there's not like safe like like you said safe routes you need safe ways places that kids are walking in front of for example like there's like at least two vape or weed shops like on either side of us when we're leaving school so either direction you leave you're going to pass stuff like that so i feel like that an example of like trying to make a safe route you got to have the way kids are coming and going home from school for it to be safe we don't need things like that learn learn leering them into and wanting to be like oh wait i see somebody over do this i want to do this for example lead by example if you see older kids going in there you're going to be like oh i want to go in there so Places like that, I feel like, should have, like, a limit on how close they're allowed to be in the school and stuff like that. And then also, I think, too, um, like, the elementary schools, they all have, like, crossing guards, and we have none. And I feel like, like, that's 
I feel like that's sad because we are still kids. We still need safe routes to school. Um, I think that's really important. Then also, I didn't even know we had bike racks. Like my <laughs> my class was facing it, and I was like, oh, we have bike racks. Like it's not well addressed. It's not well advertised. And if you're gonna restrict something, you need to have an alternative. And we don't have those alternatives right now for transportation, which I think is really needed. Yeah, and um, like MJ was saying about um, the crossing that kids have to do on the sidewalks. Um, like just last year, a fifth grader was hit by a car walking home from school. So these ways to and from school are just not safe for kids, especially younger kids who are not very aware of what's going on around them. It's just really hard to make sure you're getting to school on time when you're also having to be so aware of being safe. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you guys are you guys are very observant and you've touched on some of my pet peeves too, especially with those bike racks. I go to schools yeah. all over the state and it seems almost everywhere I go, the bike rack is pushed so far away from the school. Like if there's a field, it's on the other side of the field where no one will ever notice it. And I don't know why we do that, but it's all over New Jersey. I see that. So I love that you guys are picking up on some of the most uh, important things to me. And I'm also learning so much. So thank you all. Um, let me see. I skipped around a little on my questions here. Now I'm afraid I might ask you one I already did, but, um, let's see. So do you have any more, I, I know we touched on this already, but do you have any more kind of overall suggestions for, um, adults who want to include students in more, um, programming and more, um, decision-making processes. So we talked a bit about social media to kind of recruit people, but are there any other, just, I don't know, advice or suggestions you have for us? Um, one thing when you say that is the first thing I think of is making sure there's like advertisement for it around town. Cause especially younger kids or like adults who are on social media, they're obviously not going to see if you start posting about these things that you want to get them involved in. But if, I mean, if a mother is walking her little kid down the street and there's a poster for it, and there's a link on the poster that she can just put into her phone real quick, that's going to get them engaged. So I think definitely just proper advertising around town for what you're trying to do would definitely help. Yeah. Or like she was saying about like announcing it in schools. Not all kids listen to it, but if you like say, say certain things that will catch their attention while speaking about it. Like I know certain things when like the, for example, they're having this fundraiser for us, for us graduates of the 2024 class of 2024. And I saw that they had like extra VIP tickets for graduation or extra tickets for senior picnic. That took my attention because I have a big family. And if you're giving me a certain amount of tickets, I'm going to want extra to bring more of my family members. So, yeah, just things to like grab us to be like, oh, yeah, I want to do that because like get some encouraging it to be like, OK, I want that. OK, I'm doing this. I want that as well. Like, yeah. Yeah. And I think proper funding for things like mm -hmm. these. Like getting kids involved isn't going to be easy, especially considering everything we're already doing and younger students. Um, so proper funding to get these programs started is definitely a big must for things in school. Yeah, I think too, because in the summer, like you can get a job and you're gonna make money. And well, that's great. I would much rather have making money and then maybe doing something that I maybe enjoy less for little to no money. Like, I feel like, <laughs> Things need to be like equally funded because if this was paid, but if it was paid, I don't know like how many people would do it. So I think this funding is definitely necessary to get kids' attention into like I learned so much. Like I'm gonna be co-chair of this. I didn't even know what city planning was two like two months ago. To be so honest, and like so I think for two weeks I feel like it needs to be paid because I'm out of being city in the summer and I needed I I need a cash to be honest. <laughs> Um, They're very busy. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's the big motivator. Yeah, I agree with what she said because when I was explaining, when I was explaining to my friends what I was actually doing today instead of being in class, and I was telling them that I was getting paid for it, they was like, "Why didn't you tell me about it? I wanted to be a part of this as well." So yeah, it's just certain things that would grab their attention. And when we were doing the internship and letting it out to the mayor, some of the community came to see us. And there was one mother who specifically talked about it, how like she was like, she didn't even notice it until we had posted it out to sports because her daughter plays a sport. And she was like, she's very grateful 
that the youth were being able to be involved in this because she herself, she has younger kids that she's being put into school and she felt like, yeah, she wanted her kids to be a part of the community as well. And she wanted her kids to continue to stay here. So us bringing up these things, she was like, yeah, because she felt like her kids talked about that to her. So, yeah. Great. Thank you all. Um, excellent point. I, I <laughs> want to just quickly touch on a point that they made, and I'm not sure if you heard, but food helps. Yeah. Yes. Offer food. food. The teenagers are starving all the time. All so the time. All the time. I have pizza on the way now for them. That's how I bribe them. <laughs> yeah, to <be> <laughs> That's a great point. And that's something I think that's a little bit universal. I can always get people to come to a meeting if I have food. But um, that's a good point. I also, um, your point about respecting people's time, too. I think there's this delusion amongst some older people that, oh, you know, they're in kids, they're in school, they don't have much to do. I know that's not true. I, the, even the, the regular, without your, your additional curriculars, the other stuff you're doing without jobs, the, the course load is harder than it ever was. So I think that's an important thing for us all to keep in mind too, is kind of respect students' time. And I guess think of different ways. So either if we can get into schools as part of the school day or maybe clubs students are already involved in. Um, I'm just trying to think of all the different ways we can make it a little easier for students to work with us. So do you guys have any thoughts about that? Ways to make it easier for you to help us? <laughs> Um, I think we missed half your question. Oh. Should they come into school for the school day or fuse it with oh. things that you already got going on? I think clubs are a big thing. Like we have a lot of like national clubs and we have chapters throughout New Jersey. So that, that could be good, but maybe like maybe like once a month or something we could like meet with you guys on Zoom, like they do the same thing. Or like um yeah, they could have command like I know like the army and stuff comes in. Maybe like you guys can like set up a table, like people are interested, like and they have like competitions and stuff, just like at that. So maybe you guys can have like food or like yeah. <laughs> competitions and people could like learn about that because I didn't know about St. Christy America. I think this is for, so yeah. I think that's, um, yeah. so I think like stuff like that would make it well done. Yeah. yeah. And also just being, if you guys need people, we will gladly be on the Yes, board. we will. Um, as she was saying, like the army coming and stuff like that. And especially in our high school, like uh, during lunchtime, you always see different groups of army come and they create fun, like stuff. They have stuff in the table, like to give to us. And they make us do stuff challenges. We, they challenge us to do certain things, like either they challenge us to push up, or if you do this amount of push up, they give you this. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of kids, and usually the line is full of kids, it's like full of kids who wants to challenge themselves and to do it. So they can win prizes, yeah, and yeah. prizes is one of the things that we, we need in high school because kids love challenge and they love to win prizes. We love free stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes, sir. Um, or working for the free stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yes. One more thing I wanted to add is our sports teams. Um, our school has a lot of different sports yeah. teams, yeah. and I'm on the softball team myself. And one thing we do is um every season we um do the cleanup around town and it's like sponsored by the town. We get shirts for it and we clean up instead of having a practice one day. So I think definitely you can implement something like that where you come and you talk to us, you have us do something and you just get us involved through our sport rather than having us have to take time out of the little free time some of us do have to involve ourselves. So I think that would definitely help just making time with our schedules to get us involved through the things we already enjoy. Or also too, like I'm in some clubs and we have to go to like conferences and like that's a little hard, but if I'm missing school, oh Yeah, I'm missing school. So like that if you guys not, you guys conferences like we could attend like for my club like we have like, all the chapters come like we do projects and present each other with like important people there and we learn a lot and maybe like something like that would be cool because then we can miss school which is great and then we can also like go to the conference and hey, like hey, hey. <laughs> yeah. 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 A, a mock trial yeah which i found was great it would then we had real judges real like lawyers come in and watch us perform a mock trial which i found was great like she was a great lawyer, <laughs> and uh, just the idea, it was just took us out of some of our classes, we got to eat, food was there, um, but it was great, like, 
it was just fun to me. Like I really enjoyed my time. There was a police officer. He explained on how how they got to where they got them enjoying yeah. their time. They just it was just an interaction. Like it kept us like entertained. I was getting bored and tired. So just to bring it in. You're saying they should come into the school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With us. Yeah. yeah, not only that. Yeah. Like, as she's saying, like the sport teams, like the sport team is not only it's big in this town, especially in Bloomfield. There's a lot of kids in this school I know that do sports, and I'm part of a soccer team. And one thing we do like during the summer, and we're still doing throughout our season, is like. We get to go like to stores like other places in the town, other stores. We like work with the person where they're all fundraising for us. And you see young kids come, parents come support us. Like we posted on our uh, Longfield High School girls soccer team, his Instagram where our parents come. Um, we have friends come support us and come like out and help us out, do all those stuff. Like like she was saying, like being like in make the kids be involved in the sports team is really big yeah. because like this Brownfield is full of athletes, it's full of yeah. kids who love sports. Yeah. That's good. So they should be something I have sports considered. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of especially yeah. yeah. I think they were saying try to involve yourself in the sports teams. Yeah. That's yeah. a great and idea. Yeah, just incorporate yourself into things that are already yeah. happening. Yeah, just be right. Yeah, yeah. We can open back up again for more questions, but I think there were two or three more slides, right, Deborah? Um, just brief, yes. Okay, do we want to finish and out and then we can open up to some general questions? Thank you all for your uh, sure, sure. For doing that. That was amazing. I learned so much, and I'm definitely going yeah. to use your advice. Food. Food. <laughs> so, up here, we have the ladder next. <laughs> yeah, so I just wanted to, I wanted to kind of come back to this idea, right, of how to um, really, really engage kids um, and what the optimum, what, what that, the, the ideal would look like. Um, and so if we're looking sort of at the, you know, the, the steps four through eight, um, this is essentially the process that these young people go through when they go through the City Planning Institute. Um, you know, in the beginning, it's very much me telling them what city planning is, telling them what the project is and what they're going to do. Um, and then I slowly kind of release responsibility to the students. And we typically get to about, you know, step six or seven. And I will say that I think this is probably the first time the City Planning Institute, you guys are, are taking it to that step eight, yeah. um, in that they are going to form this municipal youth guidance council. They're going to be meeting with their town council um, uh, monthly. They're going to be meeting with a, a larger council quarterly to really be a liaison between high school students and young people and what they want to see in their town and their elected officials and city government. So. Um, I just kind of wanted to speak to that, that I do think that you guys are probably the first city planning institute that we've ever hosted that is really, really owning um, that sort of eight steps where it's initiated by them, it's driven by them, it's going to be run by them. Um, I'll be lucky if I can get a word in in these meetings, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, and so very proud of that. I just kind of wanted to speak to that. Um, you can go to the next slide if you want. And for anyone, I did see sort of a question that kind of came through um, in the chat. How do we bring this into other towns? I don't know. There it is. Um, on our website, we're the Center for Community Planning.org. We do have um, a guidebook that we created. Um, this is an authentically created guidebook by myself and other members of my team, um, where we try to walk you through step by step um, how to organize these kinds of programs how to implement these kinds of programs, how to evaluate these kinds of programs, um, you know, tips and tricks for engaging young people. And so, um, again, that is on our website. If you're interested in running something like this in your own town, um, feel free to reach out to us. Our contact information is on there, but you're also free to use the guidebook um, to implement it independently if you wish. So, good resource. Um, and I think that's it, right? So with that, I just, I, I want to say thank you, Sean. I'm sure you're going to close us out. Um, but I do really, really want to thank you for, one, um, just including us in this panel, and two, really being open to having young people speak. Um, as you can see, they're very spirited. They have a lot to say. 
I will say they were not always this way. Usually day one, two, and three, kids are very like slumped in their chairs and very miserable. Um, <laughs> they don't want to give up their summer for this. Um, but then towards the end, you can see they really, they, they form um, teams that are really engaged and critically evaluating their neighborhoods and very passionate about finding solutions to make them uh, better places to live for them in the future. So thank you for having them um, and us. We're very, very honored to be here today. And we're honored to have you. So thank you all so much for participating. It seems like we have to find better ways to make connections because I definitely want to hear from students more. And it sounds like students have a lot to say. So I think we, uh, this is the beginning of bigger conversations. And I've learned so much from you all today. So thank you so much for um, coming here, for being honest, for telling us about your experiences. And um, I definitely going to take what you have all told me into uh, consideration as we move forward to kind of expand our program into high school. So as you know, we've kind of thrown out there, um, you know, this is a little bit new for us. So thank you so much for helping us on our journey here. And um, now I'm going to open it up. We have a couple of minutes left in our scheduled session. So if anybody has any questions for either the students or any of us on the panel, and I do see some questions coming in. So um, who is the best to connect yeah. with at school administration? What do you think? I, I would say teachers, like don't, like actual teachers who are literally engaging with their students every day. Like, yeah, like the principal, and like the office people are here, but teachers are the ones that are with us, are getting to know us, are understanding us, are trying to see what is and isn't working for us. So I feel like teachers and like like they said, their coaches and stuff like that, like people yes. who are they're gonna be able to connect with, talk with. I feel like those are people who you really need to get into or contact with. Because, I think, you know, especially to teachers that are relevant to what it is. Mm -hmm. So like Ms. Schultz teaches like law and like that's Pretty close, like she helps, she helps kids, but I mean, like, don't contact the gym teacher, right? Yeah, like, like contact people who are like relevant. So, like, yeah, maybe, like, here. like, um, she also runs like Future Educators of America. So, Michelle's Wu would probably be a great person to contact. Um, but I mean, like, maybe, like, yeah, just teachers in general or like yeah. people who are involved with their yeah. students. And I will say that from, from the inception of the program, um, partnering with people in schools has been a challenge. Um, one, teachers are very busy, schools are very hectic places, taking on new programs is always hard. Um, but we have found success if you can find a, um, you know, a workforce development person in the district, um, somebody who is specifically in charge of connecting young people with jobs that, they have, that they're required to do in order to graduate. Um, we've had a lot of success with that because it seems to be that they're just, they're, they're always looking for new placements for kids. Um, so that's been a really a, a winner. Um, principals I would shy away from, vice principals, they're, they're very, very busy. Um, but yeah, I would go with what they're saying. Teachers, coaches, and um, workforce development people, counselors. Great, that's excellent advice. It's, it's interesting, I never really considered the coaches thing until right now, but it kind of makes sense because when we've done programs with younger students, we've gotten a lot of traction with the phys ed teachers and getting in there because they're very interested in safety. So it follows. I honestly should have thought of it, but I uh, thank you all for pointing that out to me. All right, let me see if we have any other questions in our chat here. I also, um, Charnel, if you have any questions, I don't want to silence you either. Please jump yeah, in. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so how do you guys how do students find time? Um, we did, in our research, we found that there were a lot of engaged clubs and other, you know, connected organizations, but I know how busy you are. How do you find time to, to engage in sports and, and also be involved in activities like this? Um, one thing I think that's great about our school is on Wednesdays, we have this thing called Wednesday Activity Period where we get out of school about an hour earlier than we usually would. And that's the time when most clubs happen or you can go to teachers for help. Um, it's a really good um, program that we have. It's the RAFT program. Um, it's mostly for freshmen, but everyone uses it. Um, another thing I would say is just making time during the school day to try and catch up on schoolwork so that after school you can go straight to sports. 
it's more just being organized and being driven to do all the things, all the things you want to do. Like I'm an AP student, I do sports and I do a million clubs. Um, but it's just having that drive to really want to do these things that you want to do and making sure you stay motivated throughout all of it to just get it all done really. And I think too, like, yeah, because I'm also a senior and I'm taking a year but we don't really do much in that class. So if I have any extra homework, I do it all in that class and like I can go straight to sports, I can go straight to my clubs. And I think it's also pressurization too because it's telling. I'm telling you your book. Um, I think it's obviously like for me, like if I'm the president of a club, that's obviously going to be ranked higher than something I might be a member of, and like or something that's important to me. So like this is obviously going to be important. So if I were to get further involved, I'd probably prioritize that over other things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just weighing your importance, like what you were saying. It's just yeah. I will say that again, this is a ten-year-old program. It it grows every year. Um, and we have found that one, running it in the summer is more effective than running it in during the school year, just mm -hmm. because students have more time. Um, and then two, incentivizing it. Like you really get the buy in. I mean, we've had conversations in our strategic planning meetings all the time, like the kids, we can't recruit kids. Um, and once you incentivize it, it's very, very easy. Um, you know, I, the stipends we, we provided this year were not you know, huge stipends. It was a small lift um, and it made all the difference. And so we really are trying to incorporate that throughout all of the programs now is that we offer some kind of stipend to the students. It just gives it some teeth and makes them feel a little more important. Yeah. <laughs> the money seems like a lot to keep. And I'm sure. And I have a little follow up. So you guys are going to be graduating. Have you been able to? Um, be helpful in bringing up the next class of, uh, of leaders? Uh, yeah, I actually told um, my younger sister, she's in um, seventh grade right now, and I told her about the internship I had did, and she had saw we also do it, and I told her, I was like, oh, we should do it, like me and you could do it together again, because she'll be in eighth grade uh, next year, and I was telling her that she should get involved as well, and at first she was like, I don't want to do that. And then I told her about the money, and then she was like, oh, yeah. like it's great. I'm sent to buy. Yeah. Yeah. Money. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even know what city planning was, but I told my slave friend, and I was like, well, yeah. sign up. Yeah. So I think even, like, even if you don't know where it is, if it's sometimes being incentivized, like in any way, you're more likely to look at it. Like I didn't know what city planning was, and I'm very involved now, so yeah. I think it's, um, as long as you start out with an incentive, it's very easy to go from there. Yeah. Uh, I also like um, tell some younger freshmen, I have friends who are peer leaders, um, so I kind of told them during what I did um, throughout the summer, the city planning thing, and they're peer leaders, and I told them you should tell, like, um, the younger freshmen, like the freshmen, the upcoming freshmen, and I told them, and I'm in the sport team, I told the freshmen about it, and then they asked, do you get paid, or do you just do it for fun, and I was like, yeah, you get paid, and I told them the price, and they're like, oh, definitely. Tell me who's the teacher and I'm coming. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and I think this is the, kind of the purpose of the Municipal Youth Guidance Council is that we're going to have this sort of core tier here, but we're slowly going to be bringing people in and, and training them so that they can take it on. Yeah. She's yeah. a junior. Um, and I'm a junior. I'm not graduating this year. But like especially like the seniors that are here, they've definitely got me more involved and have helped me throughout the way getting me to be able to start getting younger kids involved and just keeping me on track to make sure I know what's going on. <laughs> and also, like, I don't think we ever mentioned this, but for the internship, there were past seniors that graduated. So it's already successful yeah. because we're still in school and we're continuing this program and they already graduated. They yeah. were like taking over for them and, you know, juniors and other juniors in the program and other sophomores. So, and I think they're willing to do it next year. So I think it's already successful. Yeah, it's gonna keep growing. Yeah, you're, you're building a pipeline. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, like we live in as we as us seniors live in, the, the mm -hmm. as a junior is gonna come in and then new people coming in. So it's gonna keep growing every year. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you all. I, I can't thank you enough for being a part of this. This is great, and and I've learned so much. Uh, we're just out of about out of time now, but um, again, thank you all. And as a reminder to everyone who's uh, with us. 
Um, all the sessions are being recorded and we're gonna make them available on our uh, New Jersey Safe Re Roots Resource Center website. When this is done, so I'll be sure to get all you guys the link <laughs> as soon as we have it up. And um, anyone can revisit this great conversation we've had and I intend to. So um, thank you all so much for being a part of this and for being honest and telling us um, you know, what we can do better. I, I really appreciate um, you coming out and being a part of this today. So thank you all so much. And thank you, Charnel, as well. This was a great panel. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Wow. Thank, thank you, you so much. All right. That concludes our presentation. Bye. Take care, thank you, everybody. everybody. Thank you.